This is all very, very strange for me because it's so traditional that Tim gives the status of embedded speech both here and at the embedded, embedded Linux conference. But unfortunately, Tim could not make it today. He had a conflict. So I'm doing my best to fill in for him. <laughs> so we'll see how well this goes. Uh, these slides are based on his previous slides. If you've seen his presentation over the years, you know that each um, jamboree, he updates the slides. He gets rid of some of the old slides and brings in some new information. So I have his old slides updated, new things that I've added. And I have the official review by Tim. He actually looked the slides over tomorrow. And I think I'm not going to say anything really stupid. Hopefully it's, it's pretty good. So thank you for coming. If you have questions along the way, ask. Um, I'm going until what time away to sun? Well, one hour, one hour and a half. It's flexible. Okay, Maybe so you can uh, end up uh, before uh, 12. Before 12. Yes. OK. So as I mentioned before, I'm an engineer at Sony. I work with Tim and embed Linux in open source areas. I'm also one of the Linux kernel maintainers in the device tree area. Today I'm going to talk really quickly. Uh, I think I have around 80 slides, which is a few more than Tim usually has, but for me, pretty much the normal for an hour talk. And this is just an introduction to the, to the material. It's not an in-depth discussion. Uh, the idea is to let you know what's going on in different areas, give you insights into areas you might want to dig deeper into. And for many of these, we have a link to some other resources where you can learn more about the information. Um, it's just some random stuff. And as Tim always says, it's just stuff that he saw that caught his attention that he thought was interesting. Uh, traditionally, um, when we give talks like this, something always occurs at the very last second and indeed, LWM uh, printed a couple of articles in the last day or two, and unfortunately, I did not incorporate much of that material, but there's some really interesting articles this week on LWN. So these are the, the various areas in general I'll be talking about. I'll be starting with kernel versions, then moving on to technology areas, talk a little bit about the CE workgroup projects, the sponsor of this event, uh, then other random things that don't fit into those categories, and the very end, some resources, some places you can go to look to, to get some more information. So starting with kernel versions, uh, this is updated since the last talk. Tim mentioned three months ago that Greg Crow Hartman, for the very first time, was in charge of the kernel, replacing Linus. And Greg did release kernel version 4.19. And you'll notice that it took him 71 days. Tim in the past has made a point, you know exactly what day the kernel's going to come out, even if you don't know what week, it's always going to be on, on that Sunday. Um, Greg surprised us and he came out one day later. Linus has been known to do that in the past, but, but very, very rarely, so it's interesting. So now we're into the 4.20 world, we're up to RC4, RC5 should be coming out this Monday. And we can't predict the kernel releases quite as accurately accurately around holiday times. I've not yet heard what Linus has, has been planning in his own personal holiday schedule. Um, but if we stay on pace for a 70-day release, 4.20 would come out right before Christmas on the 23rd. Otherwise, it could come out a week later on New Year's Eve. Past years, Linus has tried to get it out right before Christmas. He doesn't necessarily like to work through the holidays. So that, that's a pretty good bet. If nothing else is going on, to slow him down the 23rd likely. These are slides now from 4 through 15 through 419. These will be slides that you saw last time that Tim has discussed. And I'll, I'll just quickly review some of these. Why it went into the kernel in each of these releases. Uh, the big thing in 4.15 was CramFS, a compressed file system. And one of the really nice things about CramFS is that you can use it for execute in place. And if you have um, your image is stored in, in flash, it can be really nice to execute out of flash, saving your actual RAM. Now the interesting thing about XIP is that it cannot execute out of compressed storage. <laughs> so despite the fact that CramFS is all about compressed, you can turn off the compressed part of CramFS and have an uncompressed CramFS image that XIP can use. A little bit confusing there. 
Uh, the other really interesting item here is the kernel page table isolation, um, which was the, this was in the early um, times of dealing with some of the security issues that were coming through the hardware faults. Uh, risk five support is, is kind of old news now, but there's been a lot of attention recently on that, and they're they're continuing to make progress through the current kernel versions. 4.16, um, if you've been to some of the Embedded Linux conferences, you'll know Jan from Siemens has been working on the Jailhouse hypervisor. It's a nice lightweight hypervisor, and he's providing a lot of support. The strange things that, that he does is doing real-time under a hypervisor, which I've always been skeptical, skeptical about as a real-time person, but he pulls it off. So in the right use case, it actually is possible. Uh, the eBPF is the extended Berkeley packet filter, and it's an in-kernel interpreter, which the networking people have, have used, and other subsystems are starting to try to leverage off of, um, especially tracing is starting to use that now. There were some more, um, some of the hardware fault problems um, being mitigated in 4.16. There were, there were mitigations before 4.16. 4.16 is when some of the non-x86 architectures started to come on board and have some, some fix-ups as well. Let's see anything on this one. The most interesting thing I find on this slide is as the kernel build is the functionality of the kernel grows, we, we're adding slowly um, dependencies on doing kernel builds. And there's some people who are really resisting that so that you can actually do a build on a small target system. But in 4.16, the requirement for Flex and Bison, which are the GNU versions of Lex and Yak, became required as, a, um, as the actual raw tools you needed those on the system. Previously, we had pre-built the components from, from Flex and Bison that were needed, but now you actually need the tools. And if you're using Ubuntu or, or, or a Debian system, it's a simple app to get. So uh, these have been packaged forever. All your distributions ought to have these tools available. 4.17. The really unique thing about this is the kernel usually grows in size, number of lines of source code. And this is only the third time ever that the kernel size shrunk on release. Fewer lines of code than before. Interestingly enough, we had the fourth time in 4.18. So two kernel releases in a row, the kernel shrunk because we took things out. Uh, kernel idle loop was a big thing in helping with power management, use less power. The CPU load estimation is important in making interactive systems more responsive and less sluggish in kind of the, the way it feels to the user. And that, that came out of, I'm sorry, that was the CPU load estimation. And this is some more details about the load estimation. The, the mechanism that allowed it to work better is that the old um, system PELT, P-E-L-T, was retaining too much history. And using that in the calculation moving forward, and the improvement was to, one of the improvements was to lose that history more quickly and start pulling in new information about the way that the, the system is currently loaded and working. So that should be good for, for mobile and embedded, it should be good for us. But there is a cost to it. There's a little bit of extra scheduling overhead, about 1% more overhead. And depending on your workload, it'll be plus or minus. Some more in 4.17, there's a formal kernel memory ordering model. If you know Paul McKenney, he's the RCU person. Um, he's, be, he's been behind this, and there were four or five people who, who put this project together in creating this information. It's really important if you're interested in locking primitives. 
at a very high level is probably not very interesting. But when you start looking at proving the correctness of locking, this is really critical information and it's a great step forward at the very, very low levels of the kernel. The kernel infrastructure, build infrastructure is moving forward. We keep obsoleting older versions of compilers and tool chains. 4.17 step forward requiring 4.5 or later for x86. There are some architectures where GCC is not as well supported, doesn't have the newer versions of GCC. If you're affected by that, you need to start working with people who can add that support in GCC. Part 18, the big news is power domains outside of CPUs. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, instead of just turning a block totally off or totally on, now power blocks have the ability to run at lower performance levels using less power. And that's, that's a really nice, nice feature. Um, actually, I think I'm talking about that now. The, the issue with before, if you totally power off a block, then you need to shut off the drivers that are using it. And when you power the block back on, now you need to reinitialize the drivers, reset your state. And that leads to a very large latency and complexity in code. Um, if you can instead just lower the frequency or voltage to a block and leave the drivers intact, then there's a lot less latency ramping back up to full performance. So it's nice that general power blocks have that, that capability now, not just CPUs. CPUs have had that level of granularity for a long time. Uh, for SSCrypt, um, crypto cryptography, the interesting part of the two spec ciphers are that they came from the NSA. Some people are very concerned about NSA having backdoors. Um, the, the nice thing about these two ciphers are they're very, very small, just a few lines of code. A lot of people have, have done validation of them and auditing. So that makes them a little bit less scary. But if you're worried about the NSA, just be aware that, that they are behind these ciphers. Um, they actually are, are important to embed it because they're meant for low-end devices. They're not meant to be as secure or strong as the high-end ciphers, but they're much, much less computationally expensive and much simpler to implement. So that, that's why they're interesting to us. BP filter I'm gonna talk about in more detail on the next slide. This one took me a little while to wrap my head around. It's a little bit confusing. It's trying to be a replacement for net filter. And the way that it works is that it takes user space code from the Linux kernel source tree. It compiles it with a just-in-time JIT compiler. And if you look at the LWN article, they say it uses makefile magic and OBJ tool magic and somehow out comes some, a module that the kernel can load. The strange thing is, the module is not loaded into the kernel address space. The module is loaded into a new user space process, and the kernel communicates with that process via two pipes, a write pipe and a read pipe. So it's isolating that code from being able to modify or access the kernel data. So it provides that security isolation. But it still allows you to use it for the, the network filtering The intent is to be backwards compatible with NetFilter. They'll take the IP table rules that currently exist, and they have a tool to compile them to the BPF format, which is what's used to get compiled in, into the module. And David Miller's comment on this one was accepted, was this could lead to all kinds of crazy stuff. We have no idea what's going to happen, what crazy ideas people are going to have with this. I'm guessing people are going to have all kinds of interesting use cases that were totally unexpected, totally unrelated to network filtering. And last but not least, me, yeah. Uh, uh, do you know uh, a performance impact about uh, user mode, uh, BPA filter? Uh, 
Ja, men det är något som det Ah, what, what is the per performance impact of doing this in the user space? Um, I have not seen any measurements yet, but I would expect there to be in... So, <laughs> okay, let, let me back up because there's... It's interesting, they claim that they implemented this to get better performance. <laughs> so, so that's the starting point, that's, that's the claim. And the reason behind that claim is that if you turn on the filters right now, the filter code has all the cases that it has to worry about, and then it has to do essentially switch statements or if statements, mm -hmm. branches to decide which of the filters to apply. So you have a whole lot of code, and even if you're only doing one very small filter, that big chunk of code exists there, you're not just executing a very small piece of code. So the, the thought behind this mechanism is that you only load the very small bit of filter that you actually want to use. So the amount of code in the filter process is very small. But <laughs> you, you brought up the point of user, user mode. It's in a separate process. The data is going through a pipe. So it has to go from the kernel through a pipe to user space process, get processed, and then flow back through another pipe back to, back to the kernel. And that's got to be a lot of overhead. So it'll be real interesting to see actual benchmarks to see what is the impact for different types of filters. Is it really faster? Is it really slower? Does it use more resources or less? Yes, that's a great question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and then as Tim mentioned, support for a new Qualcomm processor. Uh, not quite there yet, but at least they're working on mainlining which is a, a good change. Four point nineteen. The last time Tim talked about four point nineteen, it was an upcoming release that hadn't happened yet. So he was basing the slide on what was accepted in the merge window, which wasn't guaranteed to actually show up. Um, again, the security mitigations were, were coming in from the, the hardware problems. That, that we've been seeing all year long. Um, let's see, I don't think I have anything to say about uh, that one's but the L1 TF is related to x86 page tables. So if you're on ARM or MIPS or PID properties, you don't worry, you're safe. <laughs> uh, time based packet transmission is kind of interesting. There's going to be a slide later in the networking section talking about this. And the concept is to be able to schedule when the data that you're sending actually gets sent. So there's some interesting aspects to that. It's, it's kind of being built as real time, but it's not really real time. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then EROFs, Enhanced Read-Only File System. The interesting thing about this is it's in the staging part of the tree. It's not in the, in the normal part of the tree. And so it's, it's a little bit more fluid. The actual on-media format might change. So expect that, that to be not, not concrete yet. That, that on disk or on flash format is likely to be different in the future. But if you want to start working with it, now is the time to, to see what its capabilities are. Uh, these items I'm not really going to talk about. This is interesting. Um, we already have three polling interfaces in the kernel. Somebody decided those aren't good enough, they want something else. And so now we have a fourth one. I think this came from Christoph, if I remember right. We'll see how, how popular this, this one becomes. It, it's not as full featured, but it's supposed to be a little bit more performant. Um, now I'm looking forward what we expect to see in 420. This is based on what's been in the merge window. Uh, there's a new processor architecture coming from China, I believe, CSKY. And I haven't found much detail on it. There was one person writing about it who said that it has the same instruction set architecture as the Motorola M, M core. And they've added some more instructions but otherwise it is bit for bit the same 
format as the M core instructions. So hopefully that person was, was correct, and I'll tell you correct information. It's not, not a, a reliable source for me yet. Um, X-ray data structure is kind of interesting. It's Linux kernel developers are never satisfied <laughs> with what's there. They're always trying to prove things, especially in data structures. And this is um, a new way of doing radix trees. It's in the kernel now. Some app current users of radix trees already have been converted. Uh, for instance, the page cache has been converted to use this. That's pretty core. If the page cache is using it, you'd expect that this is pretty robust. So otherwise, the system is going to fall over and die pretty quickly. Um, there's a good LWN article on it, and there was a session on this two weeks ago at the Plumbers Conference in Vancouver, where they talked about what was going on and their issues. Another really interesting thing, I'm not sure how much this will help for embedded, is the PCI subsystem has added peer-to-peer -peer DMA support. So you do not have to move your data from one device through the CPU and then back out to another device. You can go straight from one device to a separate device through the PCI fabric. So if you're using PCI, this could be useful for you. Uh, Multi-queue API. I, I don't know much about, I, I could say I know nothing about the multi-queue API. The important thing here is basically that the legacy API is going away. So if you, if this technology is important to you, pay attention to it because you need to react to it now or someone else will on your behalf. Again, kernel developers keep changing things. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why they change them. So somebody decided, decided they wanted a new API for mounting file systems. I'm not sure exactly what's behind this one. I haven't read this article yet. Let's see whether it's lacking functionality in the current um, API, which is usually the excuse. Has anybody here read up on this? Okay. Nobody knows, nobody can help me out of this one then. <laughs> We always get um, developer statistics from LWN. John Corbett does a real good job of, of showing a graph. He usually shows a slightly different graph. This one, he decided to show something different and unusual for us. He's looking at how many patches are actually reviewed and tested. And this is something that's been uh, as a concern by the development community for several years, that we're not getting enough of our, our patches tested and reviewed that there's the the concept that all bugs are shallow if there are enough eyes looking for them the problem is there aren't enough of our eyes looking at these patches and reviewing them so that makes it easier for bugs to get into Linux if we do more review up front then our bug rate should go down hopefully so we're, we're trying to encourage more and, and you are seeing that the review rate is going up but it's still not anywhere near where we'd like it up. It's only up to about 30 percent. That's not very good. Um, we continue to have a lot of people making their first contribution. It's, it's interesting watching that year after year after year we keep getting a lot of developers, a lot of new developers. And we're back to the model of adding more lines that, than we removed. So the kernel's growing in size again. We had two releases where it shrunk. Now it's getting bigger. The reason it trunk was because we removed architectures. <laughs> this time we added an architecture, we added features. Next area is technology areas. Boot up time, nothing happened. <laughs> Come on, guys. This is, boot up time is going on for, what, 20 years now? It's been something that we've worked on over and over and over again, and it seems like it's always slow. Something's always slowing it down again. A device tree. Nothing's happened in device tree for the previous three or four talks. Since I'm the device tree maintainer, <laughs> I actually have some things. Um, Tim's talked about validation. We went from board files describing the hardware to device tree describing the hardware. 
with board files, we had a validator to validate that the data was syntactically correct. The C compiler compiled the data structures, and if it didn't compile, you had an error in your format. We lost that capability when we went to device tree, and we've been trying to add back a lot of that validation over time. And we've had an effort going on for at least three years trying to add validation so that we can validate that an actual device tree matches the documentation of what is allowed in a particular um, device in the device tree. And that's what, what these schemas are all about. And there are patches moving forward. Rob Herring, the other device tree maintainer, has a GitHub tree where he's, he's maintaining these tools. Um, anyone who wants to make contributions, take a look in there and help out. He's also added a lot of build checks into the device tree compiler, DTC. Over the last year and a, two years, he's added 20 commits worth of additional checks. So you'll notice as, as you get to a newer version of the kernel, your existing device tree, when you compile it, will start having new warnings that didn't exist before. That's because he keeps adding these checks. So over time, you have to start reacting to his checks and fix the the warnings. One thing I'd like to point out is that we used to use the ePapper as our specification document which described what we allowed in device trees. We cloned that document and we started modifying it and we're maintaining that as a separate project. That's being driven by Grant Likely out of Lenaro and that's called the device tree specification. And that also is on a GitHub and there's a public discussion list for that. Size reductions are new. Um, people are starting to notice that Device Tree uses a lot of storage on media as well as memory space. And if you all are familiar with Nicholas Petra, I think Tim may have mentioned his some of his size reductions efforts in the past. Um, he, he was trying to shrink his Device Tree footprint. And Rob also helped in coordination with him. And there's some things that made some really significant size reductions. Um, first of all, we've added a notation in your device tree source where you can mark a node. So a node typically de describes a piece of hardware. You can tell the compiler that if this node is not used by any other node in the tree, then just eliminate it when you compile it. Don't include it in the, the compiled result. Um, we generally have a generic device tree that can handle all the aspects of an SOC. When you put an SOC on a specific product, you don't use most of the features. So if you're not, if the device tree for your specific product doesn't have an actual pointer into a subset of that tree, we can eliminate all of that when we compile it. Um, in the kernel data structures, we've done some things to reduce the size of the data structures. The one that will impact you if you write a driver is when you we're writing error messages or warnings, um, typically warning about a specific node in the device tree. The full name used to give that full path, the full node name. It no longer does. So now we have a, a kernel print K format, percent P O F, which will print out that full path. So you, you need to change your warning and, and error messages to use that in the future. Rob has cleaned up as many as he's, he's found so for old drivers, it's not an issue, but as you write new drivers, you'll need to make that change. Unfortunately, if you're using overlays, you don't get this space savings. And if you're interested in overlays and space, talk to me later. <laughs> I don't want to bore the rest of you with that, but that's unfortunate. So I, I mentioned Nicholas, so he, he had a test case, and he went from 118,000 bytes down to 11,000, well, 12,000 bytes for his device tree data structure. So that's an order of magnitude space savings, which is really impressive. Is anybody using overlays or care about overlays? If you're not, I won't, I'll just, yeah, overlays. Okay, overlays were created back before the, the device tree compiler knew anything about overlays. And so the person creating the solution had to be creative in the way that he actually implemented overlays. Which, so one result of that is that metadata related to overlays 
he actually hand coded in the device tree source file. Since then, the, the compiler has moved forward, and the compiler now understands what this meta metadata looks like, and you no longer have to hand code that metadata. The compiler will do it for you. And at some point in the future, I hope to disallow hand coding the meta metadata. That should either be a warning or an error in the compiler. And you have to explicitly override it if, if you want to continue doing that. <coughs> so you can, in the future, just don't hand code metadata. The compiler will do it for you. One new feature in, in U-Boot this last year is that they handle overlays. So you can apply an overlay before you boot the kernel. And that's a much more robust way than trying to apply an overlay once the kernel is booted. It's a lot less complex. So the, the kernel doesn't have to worry about its data structures changing midstream while the kernel's already running. So I, I really encourage using U-Boot to apply overlays if that works for your use case. There's some use cases where that doesn't work, like FPGAs, who are dynamically programming their FPGAs once the system is up. And then needs to create a new device tree to describe that new hardware. And 4.21, <laughs> getting past 4.20 even, um, there should be some new checks added when overlays are applied and removed. Um, it's already been accepted by, by Rob, so it just has to get into the into Linux. There are issues where memory leaks can occur from applying and removing overlays, depending on how they're structured. And these checks will find, detect some of those and will warn you. And I'm not sure how we're going to deal with those in the future, whether we're going to restrict what's allowed to be put into an overlay so that this will not happen, or whether we're going to have to have more complex code in the core device tree to handle these cases. But at least now it's giving you time to, to be aware. I mentioned before the enhanced read-only file system, jumping out of the device tree totally. Uh, the big deal here is it's a high performance and it's good for embedded, but as I mentioned before, it's in staging. So the on-media format is likely to change. So don't, don't get, um, don't start sending out EROFs file systems in products yet. Nothing new in, in FTFS. Tim talked about this before. Graphics, again, there's really nothing new. Um, <coughs> GPU drivers, some more, or nothing new. <coughs> Other than this presentation at ELC is relatively recent. So he didn't mention that um, <laughs> in, in the previous present. Oh, I'm sorry. The, this was in the previous presentation, um, but this is a, a good talk to, to watch the video for. Don't, don't just look at the slides. You actually have to see what's going on as, as he does his, his discussion. Networking, time-sensitive networking is focused on real time. And that's a set of standards that's in process. And the Linux kernel implementation is in process. And this is actually very encouraging that the real-time area is starting to, to think about this in the Linux real-time community. The rest of the real-time world is, has been thinking about this for decade, decades, um, previously using things like CAN, but now we have some other solutions. Time-based packet transmission is different. It's, you might hear of it being presented as being a real-time solution. It's not really real-time. As soon as someone says time-based packet transmission is real-time, prick your ears up and, and stop and think about what they're really saying. What this technology gives you is the ability to schedule when you want a packet to actually get sent. So a typical networking application, you just send data as fast as you can. And as a result, you may end up with very large queues. You may send data before the receiver is ready to receive it. You may build a large queue on your receiver. Um, for example, if you're doing audio or video, you have a very synchronous data stream where it's being consumed at a very specific rate. You're not going to listen to, well, you might speed up your YouTube video to one and a half times speed, but you're not going to watch it at ten times speed. They don't give you that option. 
So this gives you, you the ability to say, I want my packs to go out at a certain time in the future, and you keep sending out small chunks and trying to keep your queue sizes down. The problem with this is that if your packet doesn't go out when, it, when you requested it to go out, it'll just get dropped, it'll get thrown away. That to me seems counterintuitive, and that's the current implementation. I don't know if that will change or not. Um, I, I don't think I'd want that behavior if I, wanted, if I had a real-time system, because real-time systems typically, you want determinacy and dropping data is not very determinate, right? This is new since Tim's last talk. There's a new standard which is under development. So the standard's not in place yet. 802.11ax. Wi-Fi 6 is what you're going to hear it called by all the marketing people. Um, I don't really know much about Wi-Fi 6 yet, but there's a, an introductory um, announcement by the Wi-Fi group, Wi-Fi organization that you can go read. So the important thing is Linux is continuing to keep up with network protocols as, as we always do. Power management, nothing here has changed since the last talk. Uh, the big deal was reworking the kernel idle loop for power savings, and that's been helpful for some systems to get up to 10% power savings. That's, that's pretty good. Again, our most recent presentation is fairly old, back to this, this spring. Real time, again, not much has changed here. There's still a lot of, they, they are actively working. It is an active project. There are, are a lot of people maintaining this. Um, they are continuing as new versions of their patch set are created. They, they are updating the supported kernels in public. So. It's not that the project's dead, it's just that there's not a lot of new interesting information. So it is still continuing. There's still some really hard parts left to, to get added in. Again, the presentations listed are all back to the spring here. No, no new presentations there. There, there were some presentations at ELC Europe, but nothing really stood out for me. Um, I, I do have a cop out for ELC Europe, since there are two other presentations today about ELC Europe. I've kind of avoided including ELC Europe updates in this slide set. So you will hear some things that, that are interesting from ELC Europe, some good presentations on, on various subjects. Uh, security, all these hardware attack vectors that we've been talking about since the spring. Uh, so a lot of this is history to you. There should be, mostly this is not new. Tim's been talking about this several previous versions. Uh, basically side channel leaks due to speculation is the general class of a problem. So on this slide, nothing new. Still, this slide, nothing new. <laughs> we get to one more slide. Finally, a little bit new. Um, so, Spectre and Meltdown are the two really famous ones, but there are a lot of other ones. The, when the researchers keep, you know, they dig into the, all the little minutiae details of the processor designs, they keep finding other little issues and ways that the hardware designers are trying to be too clever. And so we keep adding more patches to solve some problems as we discover the new issues. Um, and it's not just x86, we are getting fixes into some of the other architectures, especially, or more specifically, ARM64 and PowerPC are definitely getting some patches. And there are also some generic code. GCC is providing us some warnings of possible vulnerabilities, and people are, are just throughout the code base trying to fix those up. On the other hand, we're starting to see the performance impact. and. The maintainers have been very careful about this as they've been applying these patches. They're trying to avoid major, major slowdowns, but they've had to accept a trade-off where things have had, the fixes have had overhead. And finally, in some cases, they're deciding the mitigation overhead is too large. And there's one um, 
pushback that happened recently where one mitigation by default is turned from, from default on to default off, and that's related to SMT, symmetric multi-threading. So that's just one example where the performance is becoming more important as the default. And if you want the extra protection, you're going to have to turn that on yourself and, and make that decision that that extra overhead is worth that extra bit of protection. And if, if you're interested in the SMT case, talk to me later, because the SMT case is a little bit more complex. There's some subtleties in, in why that got turned off and why you may or may not want that, that turned on. This is really interesting. This is, I think, one of two mentions I'll have for ELC Europe. Um, Jan Kiska, I can never say his name, has been giving talks for years. He really knows his stuff, and he, and Wolfgang, um, from Siemens. Um, so they got together and, and three people to do a, a performance analysis of the mitigations for some of these issues, not just for generic systems, but for specifically real-time systems. So this is a really, really interesting presentation for people doing real-time. You can learn a little bit about it for generic systems, but it's really focused on, on real-time systems and their issues. And then there's a presentation back in ELC back in the spring. This is unchanged. System size is mostly unchanged. There's one little change here. Um, the one little change being, I talked about device tree earlier. So device tree is actually trying to shrink both on media and kernel memory usage. So it can work on smaller, more resource constrained targets. Other than that, the rest of the slide is unchanged from the, the previous some good presentations. Michael Opendocker always gives interesting presentations, very understandable. Scott Murray also is, always has good content. Moving on to testing. Um, same, same topics as before. Case self-test, nothing happened. <laughs> Fuego, Fuego is Tim's. <laughs> so, sorry Tim, you're not here. <laughs> We're not going to talk about it this much. Um, Tim will be here later today. You can talk to him a lot. I'll talk a little bit about Fuego. On this slide, nothing changed from his last presentation. Fuego is a test framework to collect together tests that, that run on Linux. And um, it builds the test. It will install the test on your target system, the system you want to test. Run the test on the system you want to test. So there's a runtime test, not just build tests, and then get the results back from that system you're testing on to see did it function correctly, did it pass or fail, or if it's a performance test, was it within the the, the performance parameters that you expected for a pass or a fail? So it's a really nice framework, it makes life a lot easier for people to, to do testing. I thought there ought to be something new for, for Fuego. He's definitely, he's, he's getting a lot of patches, he's making a lot of changes. Um, so it, it definitely is a, a very active project with a lot of people involved in it. It's not a static project. So despite the lack of new announcements on this slide, it, it is moving forward very nicely. KernelCI.org is another test group that's focused on the build and boot testing historically. And the top two bullets are old news, but the bottoms bullets are new stuff. Um, it had been focused, it had been sponsored by Lenaro, but a lot of the people moved out of Lenaro, and the Linux Foundation is picking it up as a project, hopefully. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, just to give you a, a sense of the size of it, there are 10 different labs spread around the world. And if you want to create your own lab, you're welcome to join in the effort and create your own lab with your own boards and make for wider coverage. They currently have 250 different types of boards and 37 different types of SOCs being tested. So that's a pretty good coverage, but there's always room for more. They've done over 4 million boots to date, 
and I'm sure that's going to be growing much faster in the future because they've added labs. A new feature is auto bisection. There's some other build other uh, build error systems that have um, when they find a, a build error, they bisect where the problem came from, and they'll send you an email saying you submitted a patch and it no longer builds because of commit so and so that you submitted. Um, Kernel CI did not have that feature. This is something new for them. When one of their build or runtime tests fails, they're adding the ability to detect what commit caused that failure. And that, that's especially interesting for the runtime tests because that's, that's new functionality. And the, they're adding a new regime of testing. They've been focusing on boot. There are other projects that focus on building kernels. They've been focusing on booting kernels. And now they're going to add the, the ability to test the kernel after it's booting, adding some runtime testing. So that's the post-boot testing. And there's a, an LWN article talking about those new features and where they're headed. Linux kernel functioning, functional testing. Again, nothing new there. <clears throat> Making next more testable. Again, nothing new. Um, Linux Next is the way that the maintainers try to play well t with each other. So instead of waiting until the next merge window and all the maintainers send all their changes into Linus, and Linus discovers that those different maintainers patch sets collide with each other and e don't even merge cleanly, let alone build cleanly, um, Stephen Rothwell created this Next tree. So all the different maintainers send their anticipated changes to Stephen, well, well Stephen Polslum. And he actually tries to deal with those issues ahead of time, detect them as early as possible, and get either Stephen will fix up the problem or he'll get the maintainers to, to coordinate with each other and fix those problems. Um, so it, it turns out that it's very hard to do automated testing in the next tree because with the maintainers always adding new patches that they're going to submit to Linus later, the next tree tends to be very, very unstable. A lot of times it won't build for a few days at a time, or it won't boot on specific machines or architectures. But the good news is that keeps the instability from getting into Linus's tree. So it's it's a we just it's a good thing, it just means it's hard to use this tree for automated testing. And so Stephen has added yet another branch in history to try and, and resolve that issue. That's the, the fixes branch. We'll see how that works out. Tool change, the major thing here, again, old news, GCC8 has much better error messages. GCC historically, and all C compilers historically, it seems, have very cryptic error messages and it's very hard to understand what's going on when things go wrong. It's gotten a lot better over the years. GCC8 has gotten much, much better. Um, not only more clear messages, but hints on how to fix the problem, which is kind of nice. The other tool chain uh, issue is um, the oldest GCC you're allowed to use. So that's been moved forward to 4.6. I mentioned that or I mentioned a, a minimum version earlier. I'm not sure I mentioned it was this version. So if you're depending on a tool chain older than 4.6, you're going to have to start moving forward. I think this is x86 specific, but I'm not positive. Tracing, nothing really new. Um, the story for the last year, I guess, has been that there are there's a lot of interest in using eBPF, the Berkeley packet filter mechanism, and using some of that more for the, the tracing. I'm not sure how far that's going to get. Miscellaneous things, one at a time, Y2038. I don't think we have a short name for that. 
Uh, it's a long way out. We're still 21 years away. But there are two groups that care about this. When our 32-bit our date stamp rolls over, um, it's embedded if you have a system that's going to live for 20 years. Or for the civil pe infrastructure people, do you know how long the, the time frame is for civil infrastructure? But they're, yeah. how long they want systems to last? Uh, for, the, for the system, yeah. they need to survive more than 20 years. So, so more than 20 years already yeah. for CIP? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we cannot say this system survived more than 20 years from now because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you know, already uh, almost 1919. So which means uh, 19 and 2019 mean plus 20 is uh, 2039. <laughs> right, right. So 20 years, 2019 is already past that, yeah. that period. So it's, it's not just somebody saying, I want systems theoretically to last for 20 years. These are people who are serious. They're specking systems out, saying we, are in, we plan for these systems to last 20 years. When you buy this system from us, this is the expectation you should have. So it's not just marketing speak, it's people really designing and architecting these systems to last a long time. Um, the other area which you guys probably don't care about too much, other than you want your bank accounts to work, is the financial systems often forward date lots of transactions. They want to know what a bond value is going to be 20, 30 years in the future. So they care a lot about this sort of thing. So there are partners. We can get financial people to help us in our need. There's a new Git protocol conversion. The big deal here is better performance. Thank you, Google, for doing this work. Android. There was some discussion at Plumbers about Android. There was some ELC Europe, and I'm not going to take away Tim's thunder on this. Um, they're continuing to move forward, trying to get um, things into the kernel. Lenaro is one of the, the groups behind this, and they're down to 41,000 changes. <laughs> that sounds like a lot still. <laughs> but but it, it's improved, massively improved, despite that. Yeah, so this is what I mentioned, that um, there was a, a talk at Linux Plumbers, and there was a, an LWN.net article on this. So if, you, if you're interested in what's going on there, there's some references. Next, the CE workgroup projects, a little bit, some updates on those. The shared embedded distribution, LTSI automated testing, eLinux wiki are the areas. I actually dropped. That first slide, shared embedded distribution. <laughs> you see nothing there. Nothing happened that, that I have the, the knowledge about. Um, Long-term support initiative. The big news here is that they were moving to from 4.9 to 4.14 something. And three months ago, they didn't know which 4.14 version they'd end up on. Um, it is on 4.14.75 at this point. It actually is released. It's available. Uh, you can get the, the Git version or the, a download version. A lot of industries using this kernel, either the LTS or the LTSI. It's a nice place for all the embedded vendors to come together, share their efforts. Uh, one nice thing about this is the community is, is moved to the upstream first policy and joined a lot of the other organizations that have that policy. Something that we really encourage and, and support. There is a, a new presentation here. This is the second Embedded Linux Conference Europe mention that I'll have. I said I wasn't gonna talk about that much. These are the, this is the second of the two. Um, this wasn't an actual session presentation. If you've been to the conference, we have a technical showcase one of the evenings 
where you can show off some hardware or software. And we set up a bunch of tables around the room and their posters and people will, will talk about what they've done and potentially have the hardware to demo or the software to demo in their, in their booth. And one of the, the presenters in the showcase was from Penguetronics, um, a consulting company out of Europe who are really re well respected in the community and they have some experience using LTSI, so they're showing off that. Um, if you go to the eLinux page of presentations for ELC Europe, we actually have a table at the bottom which has the posters from the showcase. So you can get that information for this presentation there. And that will be in the resources at the end, the eLinux.org. Or if I didn't put enough details there, just ask me. I'll show you how to, how to find it. Release versions, these were a little bit fluid in the last talk. Projected end of life were, were unknown, were being guessed at. So the 4.19 is the one that we now have a very specific end of life being projected out to 2020. Back to Fuego. Um, this is a project funded by, by the CE Linux project, the Linux Foundation project. So despite being, in addition to being my co-worker's project, we like it because it's our work group's project. Again, no new news on, on this particular slide. I'll let Tim talk about it later. Give them lots of questions later, make them, yeah. Um, this is an entirely new slide. He did, so this is related to Fuego. To tell him I didn't say anything about Fuego. Don't, don't let him know that I told you anything. Um, they actually had a summit in Edinburgh immediately after a Meta Linux Conference Europe, which was an invitation event um, from the different test projects to get together to cooperate better um, to create some common APIs and just make a better test community. This summit will probably grow and continue in the future. We expect to see possibly two occurrences of it next year. It's still, the schedule is still being set. So again, talk to Tim if you're interested in attending those next year. It's not clear to me whether those will be again invite only or whether the general public will be able to, to choose to attend. Um, there, there are good, there's a good history of the, the one that just happened. There are written minutes, there are the slides that were presented, and there are videos. And also action items, things that they decided they were going to do. That's pretty good documentation. Those are on elinux.org, and there's a good article about it on lwn.net that summarized it. Um, some of the action items are some standards that, that they want to create as a group. Uh, test definition, results format, and the test execution API. So what does a test look like? What do the results of the test coming back from the system look like? And how do you run a test on the system you're running it on? Um, they also have a, a mail list where where this is discussed actively. This next slide is a, a big diagram of the, the model that, that Tim and Kevin Hillman, Kevin's one of the, the primary people in the, in the Kernel CI project that's, been, that's helped create it and is making it run. Um, but they came up with this, this big model. And so those, <laughs> I'm not gonna describe this, this whole thing. We're not gonna spend 10 minutes on this. Don't, don't worry. Um, I'm sure Tim will be glad to discuss it in great detail if you're, if you're curious. But those three action items are on this slide. So there's the test format, there's the API for executing, and then there's the test results. So those feed into this model. And so you, you can see there are a lot of other parts of this model where they still need to create standards. So there's a lot of work ahead, even once they finish the first three action items. So 
So the, I should go back to that. The big point of this model was there are many different test systems and working independently and they have a lot of technology that they could be reusing among each other. And so what they want to do is try and create some standards and interfaces to make reuse of components easier between the projects. So that's the impetus be behind this model and where this, this um, group is headed, the testing summits over time. Elinux.wiki, is there anybody here who's never looked at Elinux.org wiki? Everyone has looked at it? Is anybody contributed, put content on Elinux? Uitasan's done put it on, I put some on, and you've put, surely you put information oh, yeah. on Elinux. <laughs> I put some on. Anybody else? No Linux content out there yet? Oh man, you guys, this is really, really easy. Um, <laughs> get, get an account on elinux.org. Uh, if you don't have one, it, it's really easy. Um, it, it's a human process behind it, so it might take a little bit of time. Um, but it's totally easy. Then when, when, it, when you want to edit a page, you just sign in, and it's a what you see is what you get editor. So the text pops up in a box, and you just type into it. And at the very top level of elinux.org, there's a help page, which describes the format that the wiki uses which is a really, really trivial format. Um, and it's great, you can share a lot of information with other people this way, or when people make mistakes on things they put up there, you can fix it. And we all know that the internet is always broken, right? So you always need to fix the internet. Um, I, I really like th this wiki. I go there a lot for information on, on different things. And that's where I keep my device tree documentation. I find there's no big process that you have to go through with a maintainer to submit documentation. You just put it there, which is great. Nice and easy. Um, one thing to point out is we're up to 13 years of Embedded Linux Conference slides and videos. That's one of the things that we're most proud of from our conference is the content that becomes available forever, <laughs> as long as computers exist and networks. And it's really amazing how slide sets from five or six years ago often are still extremely relevant. And for many of our presenters, they're some of the best presentations that you can find on the internet. So I highly encourage people to look there for information. Most of these Topics. Um, th this is what's, what's recently appeared on the Elinux Wiki. Um, let me jump forward a second. Okay. Um, you'd expect a lot of testing stuff to be there because Tim and, and Kevin both are are active in, in putting things on on Elinux. Um, Renaissance has been very good at, at putting their board information. It's not listed here, but Beagle Bones have a lot of good information out there. Uh, the Pi has either information or links. Uh, translations of, of documents. Here's another place where you could really contribute. If you're good at translating from English to Japanese, it'd be great having more Japanese content on the wiki. I don't think we have much, if any, European languages on there. Does so anyone see any French or German or Russian content? I, I, I don't think I have. <laughs> so you guys could be ahead of Europe really quickly, just a few documents out there. Um, <laughs> we do have event pages. We have a list of events coming up. So if you know when the next Jamboree is going to be, you can find that there, or the next Embedded Linux conference. And again, <laughs> tests, you're surprised to see tests mentioned there since these are originally Tim's slides. A lot of test information. Now other stuff, everything that doesn't fit in other categories. Community issues, trade associations, conferences, things going on in the, in the legal world, and general industry business changes. 
Tim talked about Linux taking a break. He talked quite a bit about this last time. Is there any, who all was here for the last, I should have asked this at the beginning, <laughs> who all was here three months ago or watched it on the video since then? Oh, come on, raise your hands if you were here. Should I repeat what, what Tim said? If I do, I'm going to bore you if you heard it before. If you don't raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's been a lot of talk over the years about how Linux has some really strong language sometimes. And sometimes people's feelings get hurt. And there were some events that led to Linus trying to make that less of an issue. And so he decided to take a break from being the kernel top maintainer for a short period of time. And a new code of conduct came in for the maintainers and contributors. So he announced the break at 4.19 RC4. So he'd already done the merge window, and we're part way into the next release. And he apologized for some of his email comments. And Greg Croa Hartman, Greg KH, stepped up and became Linus for a release cycle and finished off the rest of the RC releases and 4.19 release. So there have been a lot of articles in the public press. There were probably three or four LWN.net articles. There were discussion threads on mailing lists. Uh, if you don't have access to the kernel summit list, you can look at the archives of that or find someone who has those. LKML. This is a fiery subject. You'd expect a lot of really strong opinions and fights on the mail list. It was actually relatively quiet and subdued. People behaved pretty well. They weren't yelling at each other, which was nice to see. Um, so Lena said that he'd come back. He needed to consult with some people to help him deal with his behavior issues and learn how to be less abrasive on the mail lists. Um, he did go to the maintainer summit, which he leads. And he did come back to do the 4.20 merge window after Greg did the 4.19 release. So Linus definitely is back as he promised. He is active again, um, accepting the, the merge requests and the patches and participating in the, the technical discussions. So this was the, the code of conduct. This was back in the 4.19. It was actually 4.19 specifically. I'm a little bit confused here. If he announced it RC4, I'm 99% positive he accepted the this patch for 4.19. It was like one of the last patches in. And, and again, there's been a lot of discussion about this. And based on that discussion, there have been some modifications to the, the code itself. There was a very small section removed that required, put responsibility on maintainers to be the police of it. And some people were concerned about that. But later, Greg added another document in this release cycle, which tried to interpret the code of conduct. And this interpretation removes some of the concerns and issues with the base document for many people. So I think that was a good change forward. Um, again, there were many articles and, and discussions about this over time. There was discussion two weeks ago at the Linux Plumber Summit, or Linux Plumbers Conference, again. I'm not sure if there's video of that. There probably is. And there was an LWN article on that. And the core maintainers are trying to help the community adopt, adapt to these changes, help us move forward and work well with each other, which has always been the intent. We've always recognized we're a very, very um, diverse community from all kinds of different cultures and nations and languages. And it's always been very important for us to understand each other and try and work together very well despite all those differences and try and minimize our misunderstandings. So it's actually amazing how well we've done that over the years. But we're going to try and, and make it even better as we move forward. 
Moving on. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Kernel CI testing project um, was moving into, hopefully moving into the Linux Foundation. A lot of the people involved in it used to work for Lenaro and it moved on to other employment. So they're trying to bring this into a, a more, um, just a different venue. Trying to get funding, trying to get supporters. So if you have engineering support for this, if your company wants to join as a member, and financial support, uh, talk to Kevin Hillman, or talk to Tim. Tim can also help you out on this and, and hooking you up with, with Kevin. And hopefully this, this will take off and become a, an actual project in the foundation. Upcoming, well, past conferences. Embedded conference in the US was a long time ago, back in the spring in Oregon. And Tim's talked about that before. The Jamborees, you guys know all about the Jamborees. They keep going on and on and on. The Jamborees actually started before the Embedded Linux conference, right? Before you. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that until I was, I was looking back the other day. So this predates the, the conferences. You guys are the starting point, mm -hmm. which is great. And you gotta keep going forward. Um, the Open Source Summit Japan and Sorry, Open Source Summit Japan and the Automotive Linux Summit occurred at the same venue at the same time over on Daiba back in June. We we're here for that. And so it would have opened on Daiba. No, last year. Last, last year. Was, yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, we always enjoy that conference. It's great coming over and, and meeting the developers over here. Um, ELC Europe, again, just occurred in, in Scotland in late October. And Tim will be talking about that. And we have another speaker talking about that today. And the automated, te automated testing summit also occurred there uh, a day after the, the main conference. And again, here's a reference to a lot of information about what happened there and, and the outcomes of that conference. Tim did put together this slide. So I'm, I'm st I'll steal a little bit of his thunder. This was made before the conference occurred. So I can pretend it's not about the conference. In the program committee, we get a lot of proposals. And we never know what topics are going to come in because we don't tell people what they have to talk about. We just ask people to send a, top, a request in for anything that they're interested in. So some years we have a whole lot of networking talks. Other years we might have several boot, boot timing talks. Other years, we don't get any talks at all on the, on the subjects. So it's always interesting seeing what are the topics that are being proposed in any given year. And these were some that came out, came in this year, where there were many, many topics, many people suggesting the same talk, topic. Uh, kernel drivers in general, but a lot of camera-related stuff. And we've also seen camera-related stuff in some of the other conferences, uh, OSS Japan, and People were talking with me at Plumbers, wanting more information about cameras, especially synchronizing multiple cameras, say four to six cameras that are all on, a, on an automobile, that they want to have synchronous um, data flow so that they can use it um, for autonomous vehicles. That, that's becoming really important. Uh, a lot of attention to testing. We used to not have very many test talks, and now, between the kernel CI project and the build test projects and, and Tim with Fuego, all of a sudden we're seeing a lot of interest in testing and people willing to talk about it. The Octo project has always had a lot of talks. It's a very large dynamic community and, and we continue to get a lot of interest in talks from them. Um, security, we got a lot of requests for that again this year. Bootloaders, popular. Virtualization. It's surprising to me and embedded that people want to use virtualization as much as they do. There, there are a lot of cases that make sense to me, but it seems way more popular than I would have expected. Uh, real time makes sense. You'd expect that to be a topic, and we get a lot of uh, proposals for that. And networking, of course, especially with the Internet of Things being a big part of embedded nowadays. Looking forward for conferences. <coughs> Um, ELC North America was supposed to be in March. It's traditionally in the spring. 
It was supposed to be in San Diego, but it got moved to later in the summer, all the way out to August. And it will be in San Diego, along with the Open Source Summit North America. So it'll be a, a larger venue, and you'll, you'll get to see a lot of other topics in addition to ours. If you've attended ELC in the past, um, there, there are some, um, if, you, if you've been in the past, just talk to me afterwards. I have some useful news for you on that. Uh, again, the Jamborees, the way that I gave the schedule earlier today, you'll see those continue. Open Source Summit Japan Automotive Linux Summit repeats again next year, later in the year, just moving back by one month to July. And that will be in Tokyo up in yeah. uh, Shim, north of Shimbashi, over, yeah. over toward Rapunki, yeah. somewhere yeah, over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that should be a nice area to go to next year. Um, ELC Europe is going to be in October in Lyon, France, which is the su southern part. We had an ELC a little bit east of Lyon in Grenoble, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago. It was really, really cold. So y you never know. Sometimes it's nice and warm that time of year. Sometimes it's cold. Mm -hmm. So be prepared either way. This is unfortunate for us. So ELC North America is August. Then September, October, two months later, we have Europe. We don't normally have it that close. It, it was just a matter of venues where we, this one year, where they're going to be really close together. We'll, we'll just live with it. <coughs> we'll, we'll try and adapt and, and try and make the best of that. But we'll, we'll try to spread those back out so that the Embedded Linux Conference will move back earlier in the year, the following year. And then plumbers uh, tends to move between continents. So next year, plumbers will be in Portugal. Again, as usual, November. I'm not sure if, if you're not familiar with plumbers. It's The goal is to not just have kernel engineers get together, but also other technology groups that interact with the kernel. So tool chains, user space, bootloaders, uh, potentially even other kernels. So. For my project, I'd love to have BSD kernel developers come to my sessions. And the, also, Hiramachi yeah. seems to be uh, attended uh, to this year's Plumbers. Yes. And maybe uh, he is strongly recommended, uh, recommended many people <laughs> to, the, to attend. Yeah. That must be quite interesting. Yeah, nowadays, uh, uh, Japanese people, uh, engineers, don't attend to, uh, usually don't attend to uh, Plumbers. Uh, but, uh, I recommend to you to join the uh, Plumbers conference for, yeah, uh, if you have uh, any uh, budget for <laughs> ERC, yeah. yeah, of course, ERC <laughs> is also good, but, uh, yeah, you please consider about the, the half of your budget to use that are for, uh, yeah, to, for joining the uh, Plumbers conference. Yeah, Th there's some other really interesting attributes about plumbers. One is that for several years, it's been co-located with the Linux Kernel Summit. So you have a lot of really core maintainers at the same venue that you can meet with and have conversations. And we have a lot of conversations in the hallways. We spend, we have pretty long breaks to encourage that sort of get together and social events to, to mingle and, and discuss things. Um, so it, it's just a really good chance to meet those people the format is not a traditional conference. A lot of conferences, you go to a presentation and someone might put 20 slides up and talk for 30 minutes. Or if you go to my presentation, I might put 80 slides up and talk for <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but for, pl for plumbers, what they want in these sessions are, are discussions with the group, not just the speaker speaking to the group. So what they encourage is for the speaker to have maybe three slides to present the general area of discussion and then encourage a discussion going on between the group. And one interesting aspect that came out of that this year, normally the video camera is looking at the speaker. This year they had the video camera right beside the speaker <laughs> aimed at the audience because the audience is who matters at this conference more than the speaker. So that was kind of cool.
legal issues, back to boring stuff. Plumbers is fun. Um, nothing really major changing on the legal issues um, other than, I mean, you heard this three months ago um, in the McCarty ongoing saga that some people are having success in fighting back and there are some techniques that the, the open source lawyers are sharing with each other and if your lawyers are not aware of this, um, come talk to other companies who, who have lawyers who have been dealing with this. The, the open source lawyers do meet together on a pr pretty regular basis, do tend to know each other. So if your lawyers are not tied in with that group, it would be really good for them to, to join in that conversation. Just like we engineers have our get-togethers here, the lawyers have their get-togethers. And here are the lessons. Again, this was the same slide as this last session. Um, the tactics used to deal with McCarty. First of all, don't sign the cease and desist declaration. You're, you're setting yourself up for further obligations when you sign that. So make sure your lawyers know that that's a dangerous thing to do. There are other strategies they should be pursuing. Uh, prevent the problems in the first place. Make sure you're complying with the GPO. Make sure you're publishing the source code. It's, I always say it's not that hard. I, I know that there, nothing in life is easy, <laughs> especially in business. There's a lot of work behind doing it well. But conceptually, it's, it's, not, it's not a very complex subject on how to comply. Publish the source, make it available. Um, don't don't try and be tricky in the way that you comply. Just just be very open and, and do your best to to comply above and beyond because it, it's not going to hurt you. It's just going to help you. Industry changes is the next to next topic. Um, Tim talked last time about Intel selling Wind River, the implications for that. To me, the biggest thing there is potentially what happens to the Yocto project. Because Intel employed a lot of people connected to the Yocto project, and a lot of the major participants were Intel employees. Um, Yocto continues to be strong, as far as I can see. Uh, some of the, the Intel people who used to come to the conferences now have different assignments, so I don't see some of those faces. But I do see a lot of the other Intel people who have been part of that project continuing to come to the conferences, even if they are in different assignments. And there are a lot of other companies involved in Yocto. It's not just Wind River. And it has a really widespread user base. It's, it's one of the key embedded distributions that so many people are using. So I expect it to have a long lifetime and encourage you to keep adding resources uh, and working with it to, to help it grow and, and continue to, to be a, a core distribution. Um, Microsoft acquiring GitHub. Microsoft used to be the enemy. They've gotten more <laughs> open to open source. And this is just one more step where hopefully they're doing the right thing. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who will be watching this very carefully to make sure that they don't have any missteps. And they, they seem to be trying to do the right thing, <coughs> moving the right direction, and listening when we have comments. If they, if they do something inadvertently, which maybe is the wrong direction, and somebody notices, if we tell them, they'll try to correct that, which is really a good sign. The new industry change, this one's not very old, is that IBM is attempting to buy Red Hat. And of course, this will have to go through all the regulatory approvals, and it'll take a while. But this is a pretty big upheaval, because Red Hat is, potentially one of the biggest, most successful open source companies. And it's had a long lifetime. Um, I think it's pre-2000, I'm pretty sure. It was probably in the, the 90s it was formed. And so to see Red Hat acquiring the, the consolidation in the industry is potentially happening a little bit here. I'm not sure how much that will continue. And I, there are a lot of different opinions on what this means. At this point, I'm still waiting to see what happens, how that impacts Red Hat, how it impacts the industry. I haven't seen any major scary things about it yet. IBM has always been a friend of, of open source for decades. So 
So, so I don't think there are any big concerns in that regard of big, big evil corporation buying open source company. Um, given that IBM is such an, an open an open source advocate. Finally, resources. These are things to look up. Things both from this presentation and the future. LWN.net, I swear by LWN.net, without it, I would not be able to do my job. I would not know what's going on throughout the open source technology areas without a lot more work on my own part. I already, <laughs> I'm one of the, probably the very few people in the world who subscribe to L2, the Linux kernel mailing list, and actually claim that they read the emails. Most people who subscribe to the Linux kernel mailing list just archive it. Now, I, I don't read every email, <laughs> I cheat. What I do is, I just scan the email subject headers really quickly, and the ones that catch my eye, I'll stop and I'll, I'll read certain topics. But that means I'll miss a lot of topics. Um, I also have filters to, to catch the topics that are really important to me. Um, but LWN.net goes and it reads through those conversations in areas that I don't care, that I don't read through those conversations. It, it summarizes them, gives a really good perspective on on the changes, the important changes going on in open source, not just on internal, but also user space, tools, um, other projects, out, other kernels outside of Linux. So I highly recommend that. Kernel newbies, if you have people who are trying to um, do their first patches in Linux or working in a newer area of Linux and aren't really comfortable with it, uh, you should encourage people to go look at Kernel Newbies to get some support, some help. It's also a really good news source. So all of these resources here are what Tim uses to look for information for his next Jamboree presentation. And I also use those sources this time. Um, there are other, other sources, but these four really provide a huge amount of the information that goes into these, these presentations. So you can get an idea how much information we can grab from just these four sources, just from the, this slide set. And again, I always want to push eLinux Wiki. Any questions at this point? Comments, suggestions? Okay. Um, I have a question about the gifts. So I still wondering uh, the decision of uh, next uh, current LTS versions, uh, current LTS versions, uh, which was decided 4.19 this summer. Uh, because I think uh, no, my understanding is uh, the LTS version will be uh, the last version of the year. Is that correct? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Right. And right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, so the point is that historically, the version picked for the next LTS is, is the last kernel released in a given year. Yeah. So we're expecting 4.20 to come out December 23rd mm -hmm. or December yeah. 30th. <laughs> so traditionally, 4.20 would have been chosen as the LTS kernel version. It, it already, three months ago, they were already talking, they had already decided 4.19. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that was a long time ago already. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, um, I'm not uh, sure what went into that. There's, mm -hmm. So there's tradition. Mm -hmm. um, other things that come into this is that various people talk to Greg, Greg Crow Hartman. Uh, Sony will talk to him, me, Tim. I'm sure you, you talked yeah, to, to Greg, and, and he reaches out and he asks people, what's important to you? Um, things like what technologies are expected to show up in any given kernel release that you really depend upon. Um, things like what is Android doing? Is there a big player? There are a lot of different factors that come in to the decision, but it's a negotiation in the end. And in the end, you have to convince Greg what the next version should be. 
and, and I'm, you'd have to talk to Greg to, to understand why he went with 419. I, I don't, um, I wasn't paying attention to that one. And when I uh, talked with Greg, uh, he expected 4.20 difficult to release in this year. Okay, so that's a good feedback. It, it might be hard to get 420 out this year. <laughs> so we actually managed to get releases out. Um, so sometimes you get as early as RC4 being the last RC. That's really unusual. Almost always it's RC7 is the last RC. Sometimes RC8 comes out because there's still issues to resolve. And when we're having the hardware attack mitigation changes, that was leading us out to RC8s. And I wouldn't be surprised if Greg was looking forward and saying, we have a lot more mitigation issues and a lot more challenging release cycles where we might get out to RC8, which would push 4.20 into next year. So I'm. So from your explanation, that makes sense that you're thinking 420 might not get out this year. Mm -hmm. And so made that decision back several months ago to give people time to, to look forward and plan. And so Greg, Greg wants you to be able to, to make your business plans. So he doesn't want to surprise you. He really wants to cooperate with all of you. So if you're invested in LTS, what goes into the version choice, talk to Greg. Come to the OSS Japan conference. Greg will. He, he's historically he's always there. I'd be surprised if he's not there. Uh, he's at most of the OSS conferences, OS, OSS North America, OSS uh, Europe, Colonel Summit, Plumbers. He gets to a lot of conferences, and he'll even come out and talk to your company specifically if you need him to. He's he's very open to talking to individual companies. So if you're not getting hold of him in any at any other location. Send him an email, talk to him. We'll be glad to talk to you. Yeah. Are you okay? So we get it on the video because people will be. So that way, when they want to be. Sorry, sorry. In, in Japan, yes. So, I have risk five. Oh, Linux has risk five. I was talking about that. Well, risk five. Oh, no. We do Linux. I want to test it. But QME is not. It's just a board. Software or board. It's just a board. It's just a board. まあテストするときにまあ安くてやりやすいボードがあれば紹介していただけませんかっていう内容になるんですけれども、すみませんちょっと。ボードコードを。So uh, I just uh, just right now uh, I tweeted, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, risk five chip uh, people are already uh, made a, a chip uh, high five uh, uh, risk five unleash uh, unleash yeah uh, the board uh, and they are uh, they already ported the uh, part of the uh, Fedora mm -hmm. on the board mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I've heard that that will be uh, less than the two thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Do you have some idea? Um, I'd also recommend that you look at the um, the, res the Linux Plumbers Conference. Just Google Linux Plumbers two thousand eighteen schedule, and on the detailed schedule for each talk, they'll have a link to the session. 
which will have notes taken during the track as well as the slides. And they had a whole session on Risk Five, which might have some helpful information. And the, the Risk Five experts were there, so you can pick up some of the names of who to contact from that also. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have any specific boards myself. If you're looking for a suitable hardware to, uh, to start, actually there's a 96 board uh, released by uh, Linaro's partner called, uh, uh, what's the company's name? Uh, Bitman. Bitman is really famous in China. They uh, build a, uh, like Bitcoin uh, computers um, and they come up with the latest uh, 96 board uh, uh, using RISC-V. I think the uh, retail price is $130. Oh, uh, <laughs> That's impressive. That's good. Okay, so. We directly finished uh, this morning's session. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you.